Good morning. Um, my name is Carol Johnston. Good morning, Video Cafe. And uh, this is my husband, Ray. Most of you know him. <laughs> yeah. it's, bring, it's bring your husband to church day. <laughs> How many of you guys know exactly what she's talking about? And we're going to be talking about surviving the storms of marriage. And um, some of you may have heard before this, uh, there was a man who was involved in a car crash. And one thing led to another. And he woke up in the arms of his wife. And he just looked at her and he said, you know, you've always been there for me. He says, you were there when I lost my job. You were there when I broke my legs skiing. You were there when I fell off the ladder when I was hanging Christmas lights. You were there when my appendix burst. And now here you are again. He paused and she said, yes, dear. He goes, I've decided you're bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes just living together can be dangerous. Yeah, it's kind of like the lady. Tell them what that lady said. Oh, this lady said, I didn't know what happiness was until I got married. And then it was too late. <laughs> just so you guys have some equal time. By the way, when we speak on marriage around here, we like to speak together so women, you get equal time. Got it? Yeah, cheering's breaking out. Yeah. The, um, uh, and guys, I'll have your back. Like the husband who said, she converted me to religion. I didn't believe in hell until I married her. Now, um, <laughs> so what we want to do... Harsh, <laughs> harsh. Oh, knock it off. The, um, so what I want to do is invite you to reach in and grab out these message notes that say, staying in love. And here's what I want to say. If you are, if you are married, raise your hand. Okay, good. Take good notes. If you are not married, raise your hand. Take even better notes. And if you are in high school, raise your hand. Good. Write everything in triplicate and we will be checking this afterwards, okay? This is a big deal because folks, marriage, marriages are dying at record numbers in America. I'm gonna put three statistics up on the screen. This is a national epidemic and tragedy. The average failed marriage, when it fails, dies in about 7.2 years. Okay, notice the next one. America has the highest divorce rate in the world. Thank you, Hollywood, California, for shaping everybody's values since 1950, okay? And this is even more depressing. Over half of the divorces in the world occur in America. At least we're leading at something. <laughs> and if you go, what, what is the epidemic of, of, what is blowing up homes? What's wrecking homes? What's wrecking kids' future? What's destroying marriages? We actually think this. It's the whole thing is in Matthew chapter 7, the very end of it. Jesus told this parable, and he goes, hey, you got two houses. One's got a good foundation. The other guy's on, you know, on sand. And he goes, storms hit. Rains come down. Floods come. Winds blow pow, bursts against the house. And what you read this passage, you go, Jesus is saying two things. Guess what? Storms are going to hit your life. Storms hit every home in Matthew 7. No storm went like some stupid Christian TV event. She goes, oh, if you're a Christian, God will bless you and protect you from every storm. No, storms hit everybody, okay? Raise your hand if you've gotten hit by storms, no matter what, in the last couple of years, you had tough times and storms of it your life. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. It's been in the last year. Raise your hand. I'm doing pretty good, but I know one's coming. Okay? And so we're going to start. We're gonna, this is going to be an honest marriage conversation. Y'all ready? Here we go. Well, um, three storms that are going to hit every marriage. Write these in. Storm right. number one. The first storm is the culture we live in. The culture we live in. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, uh, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Difficult times will come. You can circle that word difficult. And it says, following that, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. And then it gives a whole bunch of other adjectives. And then it says, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You can actually put like a number one, two, and three over lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure. And so if you're looking at that verse, if some of you are going, 
I would actually like to screw up my marriage, wreck my marriage, wreck my future, cause as many difficult times in my life as I can. Here's the prescription. That, see that verse? Difficult times, where do they come from? Lovers of self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure, okay? In other words, and we have whole philosophies built on this, ready? If you, if you jot them down, um, here we go. Lovers of self, that's humanism. Lovers of money, that's materialism. And lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, that's hedonism. Welcome to California. It's almost like this verse was written for Northern California. And the problem is this, when this stuff happens, you get, we saw a cartoon recently. Right, the BC cartoon. We see it up there, on the, we'll put it up on the screen, there we go. And he's looking up the definition of a prenuptial agreement. And the definition is this, an agreement between two people who love each other almost as much as they love their possessions. <laughs> Harsh. <laughs> the, now, before we go to the next point, take a look at those three things. Lovers of self, love. We actually believe this. Most people, when they have problems, blame their marriage. Okay? Marriage doesn't create problems. It reveals them. And most of the problems we've had in our marriage, when you really get down to it, it's, re, it's, it's, it's basically going, it's revealing that I'm too, I'm too into myself and my marriage is wrecking me being selfish. I'm too into money, which is I want what I want when I want it, and marriage is wrecking me from getting what I want when I want it all the time. Or uh, lovers of pleasure, in other words, I want to do what feels good, all this kind of stuff. And a lot of times, marriage is basically revealing the three marks of immaturity, which is somebody is self-centered, money conscious, and only exists to please themselves. The three marks of immaturity, and marriage is fundamentally revealing, um, marriage is a tough place to be an immature person. Wouldn't you agree? And marriage reveals how immature I am. We'll come back to that in my own life in a minute. Okay, storm number one is California, the culture you live in. Storm number two is the conflicts you will live with. The conflicts you will live with. Every relationship, even good ones, have conflict. <laughs> um, there was a, a guy before he got married, his father-in-law took he and his uh, bride-to-be in a room and said there are f <laughs> these five areas of marriage you will probably have conflict in. Money, sex, in-laws, children, and communication. He said, my father-in-law was a prophet. In our marriage, we went five for five. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and, and pretty much uh, so we occasionally. The, right. matter of fact. Yes, we, we did. We had a, our first big uh, fight was when we were trying to prepare a message on marriage years ago. Yeah. It was wonderful. So, do you remember the restaurant we were in? Yeah, we were in a restaurant called Baker Square, and I think I ended up in tears, and uh, it was not a good thing. So, so, like, if you're going, oh, this perfect couple's got to talk about how we have the perfect marriage. We had a, our first really big fight was in Baker Square when we were preparing a marriage message. So, I just don't talk to him the whole week. Like, this past week, just, we don't talk, yeah. and then we, we'll <laughs> so, do this fine. And now, <laughs> if you're going, well, that's just Ray and Carol, we have another pastoral couple who, I won't tell you which one, but John Valinsky told me. That we're, we're, last night we were talking about our big fight we had. We were preparing a message on marriage. And Valinsky goes, oh, yeah. And his wife's like, yeah. And we're like, what? And they said, the first time we prepared a message together on marriage, he goes, our fight was so bad, Laura said, I didn't even show up. He had to speak by himself. <laughs> right? and, and so, and one of the problems is this, okay? Some of you are going, oh, if I have a marriage where there's problems, every other fake couple in church, they're perfect, and Billy and Ruth Graham, and Rand Carroll, and, and the Bible, the, these loving marriages in the Bible, and, and then there's us. Second class marriage in the family of God. You know what's funny? Conflicts all over the place. Matter of fact, in the Bible, check this out. There's a great book in the Old Testament called Song of Songs, okay? It's the romance book. Um, anybody who wrote the Song of Songs? Okay, let me ask that another way. Some Bibles list it as the Song of Solomon. Who wrote the book Song of Solomon? Very good. You're Bible scholars, okay? Solomon 
is obviously, drop, I, he's head over heels in love and all shook up with his wife. And he says this, this is Song of Solomon, verse 4, chapter 4. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil. This guy's like, he's like going to go after every part. Like, your eyes are amazing. Your hair. And then verse 2, your teeth. And then verse 3, your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. And then and he goes on. And goes, your temples are amazing. Your neck is like the tower of, I mean, this boy is in love. And then, and then verse 5, this is in the Bible. He goes, your two breasts. Or, your two breasts. Or like, the, um, uh, your two breasts are like two fonts. And he goes, he loves this. He goes, I will go to the mountain. And then, and then verse 7, he goes, how beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful. There is no flaw in you. Aww. Everybody that's not married is going, ah. Oh. Everybody married is going, what? <laughs> and Solomon's going around going, I'm in love, I'm all shook up, I'm perfect, she's perfect, life's perfect. I just, I'm going, and then two verses later, he goes, you've stolen my heart, my bride, with a single glance of your eyes. You go, this, you're going, whoa, the Bible's picture of marriage is amazing. Who wrote this? Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Same guy, a little while later, says this. A nagging wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof on a rainstorm. Restraining that woman is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. Nag, 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 nag. The witch uh, is conflict. Matter of fact, watch this. High school students, watch this. If you're married, raise your hand. If you've had a fight, raise your hand. If you've had more than one fight, raise your hand. If you had a fight on the way here today, raise your hand. Okay, we can help. The, and one of the reasons we have fights are men and women are as different as night and day. Would you agree? That's why we made a list. Top five things, women, that you will never, well. Top five things you'll never hear a man say. Number five. <laughs> Here, honey, you use the remote. <laughs> Number four, surprise, I rented Anne of Green Gables and Emma for the weekend. Number three, while I'm up, can I get you anything? <laughs> Number... <laughs> Number two. What you won't hear your husband say. That's right. Sometimes I just want to be held. <laughs> and number one, why don't you come to the mall with me, and, and I'll help you pick out some shoes. Guys, you want to hear our list? Top five things you'll never hear a woman say. Can we not talk tonight? I'd just rather watch TV. <laughs> what do you mean today's our anniversary? <laughs> Number three thing you'll never hear a woman say? Oh, that diamond's just way too big. <laughs> and, and honey, You'll never hear a woman say, hey, for our honeymoon, why don't we go fishing in Alaska? <laughs> and the top thing you'll never hear a woman say, hey, don't stop for directions. Let's just try to figure out how to get there ourselves. <laughs> you're going to have conflict because you're so different. That's right. And you almost think there ought to be a mandatory law in America that before you get married, you actually take a class on how to resolve conflict. Absolutely. Um, you know, how many of you were taught conflict management skills in your premarital counseling? Well, if they did, you probably weren't listening because you were so uh, set on getting married. But we want to ask the question, what causes conflict? If you were to fill in that blank, what causes conflict, um, what would you fill that in with? So there are five, growing up, whatever family you've grown up in, taught you a way to deal with conflict, okay? Almost all of us in here, and I'm gonna describe five ways to deal with conflict. Wait, before right. you that, I gotta fill in the blank for them. They want the blank. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were waiting for me to say something. Oh, I, I was, but we'll it was something else. We'll fight about this later. <laughs> <laughs> I should quit interrupting, huh? James 4 <laughs> says, do you know where your fights and quarrels come from? They come from your desires that war within you. 
which is pretty profound. The Bible is crystal clear. The Bible says that conflict, and you can fill in the blank, is caused by selfishness. Now you can go. <laughs> <laughs> so there are five ways to deal with conflict. And as I describe these, I want you just to ask one question. Which am I? Not me, you, okay? The, um, and, and, and then, and then, because everybody has one of these. So here we go. Some of you, um, you're a my way resolver. My, my way means I'm going to get my way. I'll fight till I win until you give in. I'm always totally right. Like the guy who married this guy, I thought I, thought I was marrying Ms. Wright, Mrs. Wright, and I found out her name was always. The, um, <laughs> I'm totally right, you're totally wrong, I'm going to get my way, and I'm going to assert my will until you say, uncle, some of you, that's how you resolve a conflict. I'm going, we're just going to fight till I get my way. Why are we fighting? Because I want? Other people are going, I don't like, I don't like conflict. That's no way. No way are you getting me into this fight. No way do I want to have an argument. I withdraw, pull back, ignore the problem. My rules avoid conflict at all costs. That actually keeps the marriage pretty calm, but nothing ever gets resolved. Okay? My way, no way. And then some, this is the doormat way. Have it your way. Your way means I always give in. I want your approval so bad, I roll over and play dead. I become a doormat. Again, that produces a peaceful relationship, but it produces a lot of bitterness in the heart of the person over the long haul. Okay? My way, no way, your way. Then the third is this. That's where we compromise. It's, well, I'll meet you halfway. Okay? We win some and we lose some, and I give in some. I actually, I give in sometimes. That's good. But, and it's certainly better than the previous ones, but there's an either higher level of conflict revolution. And the, here it is, it's our way. It's our way. Our way is when we work stuff out together and try to figure out our way. Uh, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, we had this conversation and we kind of went, you know, why don't we live, why don't we, we call it, if you're taking us, right, we just want green light living. What green light living. And so we're pretty much going, if I think so we should do something, but she doesn't, I just assume we don't have a green light yet and vice versa. And, it's, and I'm kind of going, we actually believe when we're unified and we agree, we've heard from God. It makes it impossible to get anything done, but it is a lot healthier. I'm actually, what happened is this, that actually means the key to this one is this, we care about the relationship more than any single issue. Does that make sense? We value the relationship more than we value the things we are trying to fight over. And so what we've done is we've taken those five ways to deal with conflict and we put those on a chart down below. So, and we filled the chart in for you. But as you look at that chart, you're going, there's high assertive and unassertive, and then there's uncooperative. So you, know, you got that sort of thing, and it really breaks into five areas. And then here's my question, which one are you? Which one would you write your name in? So we fill this out. And so Carol's name goes in the Our Way box, and my name goes in every other <laughs> box, fortunately. The, and so the conflicts you live with are a big deal. That's right. And so we have the culture you live in, the conflicts you will live with, and storm number three is the crises you will live through. Now, you may feel like, okay, you know, the culture thing, that doesn't affect us all that much. We've been able to kind of avoid that or protect ourselves or, you know, live out in the boonies or whatever. But uh, the conflicts you will live with um, and maybe you're really good at conflict resolution, maybe, or maybe you don't have many conflicts. But storm number three, the crises you will live through, applies to everyone, right? Um, it could be the death of a child. It's those unexpected things that come up in our lives, and we all have them. An unfaithful spouse, a financial crisis, a business failure, being fired or laid off. Um, maybe you've uh, had a miscarriage or you've experienced a stillbirth. Um, maybe it's a major illness or the death of a close friend or a family member. 
Um, but the one thing we want to say is Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. That's right. So what we want to do is ask this question. When the rains of culture and the floods of conflict and the winds of change hit your marriage and hit your family, and hit your life, the most important question is this, according to Matthew 7 and Jesus. Do you have a solid foundation? Do you have a solid foundation? In other words, what do you need to do to storm proof your marriage? Now, would you make sure your pen's out? I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna have you deal with these next two verses, okay? Um, Proverbs says this, homes are built on the, what's the next word? Foundation. What's the, fa Hollywood goes, oh, it's the foundation of feelings. No, homes are actually built on the foundation of wisdom and understanding. We are going to give you some wise words out of God's word so you'll have a solid foundation. Notice the next verse. I love this. Uh, uh, I pray that your love will keep on growing. That's what God wants for every marriage, that you have a solid foundation and your love keeps on growing. How does that happen? The same way, because of your knowledge and insight. So we want to give you three essentials for building a solid foundation for your life, relationships, marriage, future, and everything else. Uh, this may be the most important thing that's happened around here in a year. If you get this down and this is how you live, you can actually have a future that you never dreamt. And number one, the number one thing to build into your foundation, to give a solid foundation, is not going to sound very spiritual. And number one is this, keep your cool. Number one is keep your cool. Some of you are going, why is that a deal? What do you mean by that? I'll give you an example of that. Um, we, we get married and we go on our honeymoon to Hawaii where God wanted us to go on a honeymoon and minister to people at the Sheraton. And the... <laughs> And so we went on our honeymoon to Hawaii. And I tell you what, I, the first few days of our honeymoon, the first four or five days, I was emotionally all over the map. Okay? And when things were going well, I was sitting there going, this is awesome. This is going to be like this forever. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Four hours later, something would happen. We disagree about something or something would happen. And I'd be like, oh, this is horrible. I'm stuck forever. I'm a Christian. I can't get out of this, you know. They, um, we're on day four, you know. This is, oh, man. And then, then four hours later, it'd be great. I'd be like, this is awesome. And then, oh, man, this is bad. And I was, uh, it was about three or four days, up, down, up, down. Raise your hand if you know exactly what I'm talking about, okay. Uh, four honest people. The, and, and so about the fourth day, I went for a walk on the beach, okay. And if you're ever going to get married, listen to this because I, I make every couple that we marry know this. What God, I went for a walk on the beach and I just said, God, you gotta help me wisdom and understand. I need some wisdom. I said, what's going on? And God rescued my marriage before it got started by telling me this. Chill out, keep your cool, relax, trust me. Because when things are going badly, it's a storm and storms don't last. So I got some, well, things aren't going well, don't get shook up because that's not going to last. And then God also told me, and when things are going great, enjoy the ride because that ain't lasting either. Does that make sense? Keep your cool. And the problem is that so many people come to church and they think the Bible teaches stuff the Bible does not teach. We're going to give you three things God never said about marriage. Right? Number one, God never said marriage would be easy. God never said change would come quickly. And God never said my mate would meet all my needs. Yeah, I taught her that one. <laughs> um, there's a, Bill Hybels wrote a book on marriage, and he made this very profound point about marriage. And... Um, it just shows what a kind of a myth this is. But marriage, um, we, we put them up on the screen here. Marriage will not end your loneliness. It will not heal your brokenness. And it will not assure your happiness. I think sometimes we have that 
misconception that if only I was married, I wouldn't be lonely. If only I was married, this brokenness would be healed that's in me. And if only I was married, then I'd be happy. But if you took an unhappy, broken, lonely person and put them in a marriage, you just, you have a situation where now she can just say, now I can blame it on him for all those feelings that I have. But um, we just, this is so true. There's only one person that meets those needs, right? And that's Jesus. That's Jesus in our lives. That's right. And if you're, if you're not married yet, would you raise your hand? If you're not married yet. Okay, good. Uh, if you look at, uh, hey, let's put those back up just for a second. Just like Carol said, a lot of people that are not married are going, oh, I'm looking so forward to get married. Because when I get married, I'm not going to be lonely. And I'm not going to feel so broken. And I'm going to be a whole lot happier. Then they get married and none of those three things happen, but now I got somebody to blame it on. Okay? The let God restore those things in you and then you bring a healthy person into the marriage and two healthy people is going to equal healthy marriage. Okay? Um, the God, and under this keep your cool thing, can I tell them that story? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I hate telling this. Uh, so we, we, we're newlyweds, we get married, been married about a year, and we buy our first home. And it's, it's, a, it's the world's smallest house, you know. And, but it's, it's a new home, which sounds like a great thing until you walk in and go, nothing came with it. Like, where's the drapes? Oh, you have to go buy those and put them in. Well, just full disclosure, I can't fix anything. Okay, I'm totally mechanically, ch is anybody out here good at fixing stuff? Give me a bunch you got, great. Come over to my house, would you? Um, the, it is, uh, like I grew up playing sports and never doing anything. She does not know that, so I'm assuming she's thinking, you know, so I'm going, I gotta be hand come handy, man, but I got no clue what I'm doing. Um, and so we're in, our, we're in our home and we've been there a few weeks and we're like, one night's a Friday night, and we go, hey, let's go buy some drapes and put drapes in the living room and cover the sliding glass door. So we go to a fancy drape place, J.C. Penney's, and <laughs> we buy some drapes and a, cur and a rod. And then we go, we go back. Now, I, I'm going, I, I go, I got to impress this woman. I mean, this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. And she has no clue. And I had actually previous just to look like I knew what I was doing, went out and bought a tool belt. How many of you guys have a tool belt? They just, you just look, you look more competent with a tool belt on. I mean, it's like the old gunslingers, you know? It's like you hook that sucker on, take, this, take, you know, take the hammer right there. I walk in, I'm thinking, she's going to be impressed, man. I am like, hey, I got my tool belt. So I get this tool belt, and so faking her out so far that I know what I'm doing, open that thing up, instructions. Guys, what do you do with instructions? Throw them away. And uh, so we're working together on this. Now it's about 9 o'clock at night, 9.30 at night, and we drill some holes, put the curtain rod up, and, um, and I'm feeling like, this woman's got to be impressed with her husband, handyman, Ray. And so, so we put this thing up, and then I, I'm so proud of myself. I'm not telling her this because I'm acting like, yeah, you know, I used to do this as a living. And, <laughs> and, then, and then I hang, we hang the drapes, and I realize the minute we get down off the, off the chairs, I, I, this is awesome until I get down, and I realize the drapes are like six inches above the carpet. <laughs> and now I'm kind of getting embarrassed and I realized the problem was this, we hung the curtain rod six inches too high. And now I'm embarrassed and I start losing my, keep your cool, I ain't doing this. So I start losing my cool. So we get that thing up, take it back down and uh, drill more holes, okay? And put, you know, put the curtain rod lower down six inches. And now it's at a lot 11 o'clock at night and I'm getting kind of really frustrated. And I, we get this thing up and we hang it and it's the right height. I'm going, good, finally, that's great. And now at least he thinks, well, one mistake, the guy probably still knows what he's doing until we close the drapes and they're like six inches apart because I've hung the stupid curtain rod too far out, okay? So 
I now I'm really I'm embarrassed. I'm losing my cool. I'm acting like a jerk. I'm going, okay, I'm tearing this stupid ride. It's ridiculous. Why didn't this thing come with instructions? You know, the and so so I, I get this thing off, and then at one point, I think at one point you said, I'm out. I'm, <laughs> I'm out. going to bed. She goes, I'm going to bed. She sneaks off, which translated from the original Greek means I'm getting away from this jerk. So she goes to bed, and then I take the stupid curtain rod down. I put it up the right height, right width, and hang it up. Everything's good. I stand back, and I go, our wall has so many holes in it, it looks like a machine gun battle broke out in our living room. Okay? I go, we'll have to fix that later, and of course, I can do that. And so, so then, now I'm just, I'm, I, I'm going, so I go, I got to go to bed. It's like 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. So I'm walking down the hall, and I, my study's there, and I go, my, the desk is open, my Bible's on, and I go, <sighs> I should probably read my Bible. So I go in, I sit down, I start reading the Bible, and then I, and then I kind of chill out. And then God says to me, Ray, th- y- you hear you and your wife are, You're in your first home. You're newlyweds. You're in your first home, doing your first project together. And this could have been a memory. (laughs) Well, well, it is a memory. (laughs) This could have been like a really cool memory, okay? But it's not a really cool memory because you got so uptight and acted like a child and a jerk. And so I asked God for forgiveness, and then I went to bed. And the next morning, when we woke up, I so here's exactly what I said to Carol. I said, "Honey, I'm really sorry for last night. I acted like a complete child. Will you forgive me?" She agreed, and then did. Okay. Does anybody else out there know exactly? Has anybody else had a similar experience? Okay. One of, the, one of the keys, a solid foundation for a healthy home is learning to keep your cool and to stop expecting that, every, that marriage is going to be easy, change comes quickly, and my mate will meet all my needs. Number one is this, calm down, chill out, trust God. Does this make sense? It's huge. Just ask yourself, does anybody want to be married to a rageaholic firestorm of a person? No. Okay? Number two is this. Play good defense. Play good defense. In other words, learn to let go. There are 21 words. The Bible is not even two chapters old where God goes, I'm going to give 21 words that will shape the world for all time. I actually believe this. These 21 words, well, let me read them. These 21 words have shaped America more than our Constitution. Our country is the country it has been and has been a great place to live because of these 21 words, more the Constitution. And if we throw these 21 words out, we're going to create a country that is unimaginable in terms of what it's going to be like to live in it. And what are the 21 words? They're right here, okay? That is why a man, what? Leaves, we're going to say that word together. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is United to his wife, and they become one. Now, look up here for a second. I just want to ask you a quick question. God looks down at Adam and says, leave your father and mother. First time I read that, I was kind of a new Christian. I went, that's weird. Adam didn't have a father or a mother. God says, leave your father and mother. I've got God getting senile, chapter 2 of the Bible. He's getting a little tired. They're writing this thing. And And what I realized is this. God wasn't. Tell, God was laying out a prescription for all time, and He was saying this. And you'll agree if you think about it. Okay, God is saying you cannot have a healthy marriage until you let go of some things. Would you agree? You can't have a healthy marriage, and so we are going to give you five things that you have to give up to have a healthy marriage. Five things you've got to let go of. These are things that if you don't let go of them will increase problems. They will wreck your home. They will ruin your future. These are five things to let go of. Right, and the first one is the silent treatment. We can, we can mention <laughs> hold on, these hold on. five. Say, say it again. The silent treatment. All these people started, anybody good at this? Okay. <laughs> The silent treatment, you know, that whole thing, uh, anything wrong? No. You want to talk about it? No. 
Um, you know, it's a surefire way to kill a marriage. Um, let me just say also these five things, you know, we've struggled with some of the, with all, probably all five of these things, and, um, and we just want to share them with you. So uh, don't think we uh, have this all figured out. Number two is threatening to walk out. Let me just say these five things also apply to our friendships. It applies to a lot of things. How do you move forward if you're giving somebody the silent treatment? How do you move forward in deepening a friendship if you continually are threatening them to leave the relationship? The third one is sarcasm and ridicule. This was a staple in the home that I grew up in, being uh, sarcastic comments, teasing, all that kind of stuff. It was, I've spent a lot of time with my family recently in the last month because my mom's been in the hospital and so my sister and I have spent a lot of time together um, in the hospital visiting my mom and just kind of reminiscing in, in the home that we grew up in and some of the things that she definitely remembers about the comments and the words that were used um, at her were super hurtful. And, um, and I just, when we started, when we got married, uh, we just said, you know what, that's not gonna be part of our home. I want our relationship to be secure and I want our kids to come home to a safe place that they don't feel like they're gonna get ridiculed or that sarcasm is not um, a part of that. Um, the fourth one is unhealthy relationships. We need to let go of unhealthy relationships. There's a couple of things just as a trigger that you can think about. And the first one is don't listen to a member of the opposite sex to complain about their spouse. That's a really safe place um, to stay away from. It's very dangerous to be that listening ear for someone. And the second one is, is if there's electricity between you and somebody that, that is not your spouse, um, that flirting aspect, um, there's two options there. You can either let it flatter you, and that's dangerous, or the second one is back up and go back to your spouse and let that go. That's right. The, uh, how many commandments are in the Bible? Okay, let's try it one more time. It's not a trick question. How many commandments are in the Bible? Good. If I could add an 11th, here's what it would be. Thou shalt not have any Facebook friends that thou used to date. And you're going, whoa, whoa, that's a little tough. Former attachments will keep you from attaching. And, the, and you, you, instead of cultivating, you compare, which wrecks a marriage. Some of you are going, well, that's a little harsh. That's a little tough. That's kind of crazy. I'm going, watch this. Raise your hand if you have a car out there somewhere in the parking lot today. Okay? Keep, what, keep your hand up if you locked it. Yeah, why'd you lock it? Look around, all these crooks. <laughs> you, you locked it because there are some things in your car that are valuable. And if something's valuable, you, of course, protect it. More people protect their car better than they do their marriage. If something is actually valuable to you, protect it. Number five, let go of is destructive family habits. Destructive family habits. My mom and dad had, they actually had a pretty good marriage for a while and then started drinking and then started drinking a lot and ended up wrecking their marriage. And I had dinner with my mom, what sharp lady, she was awesome. My mom one time looked at me at dinner and she said, your father and I would have never gotten a divorce if we hadn't started drinking. I brought that into our, our marriage. So we pretty much went, you know what? I'm, we're just not gonna go there. Destruct Now, it may not be that one, but every family's got some healthy habits and some destructive habits. Don't bring the destructive ones in with you and be on guard for those, okay? And the, and the, by the way, and the third foundation, keep your cool. Play great defense. And third one is this, stay faithful. Stay faithful. Lean into God and to each other because that verse has two parts. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. United is actually the Hebrew. The, in the old Bibles, it said leave and cleave. Okay, what did that, what the Hebrew word is the word for super glue. The Hebrew word is the word for super glue. Okay, I'll come back to that in a second. There are two things, God, we're wrapping this up in about two minutes. Y'all with us? There are two things 
God Almighty wants every couple to know, and if every couple actually got this in America, it would turn the statistics that we showed you at the start around and heal our country and heal our homes and give our kids a safer place to grow up in a country. Okay? And the two foundations this. God Almighty has put us together. God Almighty has put us together. The problem is God loves to put opposites together because opposites attract. And then you get married, and then opposites attack. <laughs> but occasionally, you, and, then, and then the third thing is this, your life choices will echo for generations. Your life choices will echo generation after generation after generation, which is why if you feel like we're really passionate about this stuff, high school students, if I could talk to you and everybody else in here for just a second, um, when I was your age, I was 18 years old, senior in high school. I was an atheist. Most of you know this. I was an atheist. Talked a guy out of becoming a Christian when I was in high school. This does not look good on the pastor's resume. <laughs> and uh, my mom and dad ended up blowing up their marriage my senior year in high school and got divorced. Um, when they told us, I was like, I didn't say anything, but I was like, I'm not surprised. Because nobody is married in my entire family tree. Sister's been married three times. They all busted up. Um, grandparents' marriage blew apart. You, go, you can go back 150 years in my family tree. There is not one lasting marriage. I meet Christ when I'm 18. Get committed to the Christ and get, start studying the Bible and get into a great church like this one, smaller, but like this one where they're teaching me God's word and calling me to disciple, calling me to you know, all this stuff. And, um, and it changed my life. And when you change your life, you change your future. Carol and I, <clears throat> this is kind of cool. Um, the I meet Christ, God starts working on me. And then, as a matter of fact, I made a big decision one time. I heard this guy give a talk on becoming a godly man. And I was like, that's not me yet. And this guy said, if you can't date, as a godly person, you shouldn't date until you can. And so I went, okay. I prayed. I said, God, I'm committing. I'm not dating until I can date somebody as a godly man. And um, I thought it'd be like three weeks, you know, <laughs> like two years later, you know. And, um, and it just, when you change your life, you change your future. Christ changed my life. The Bible changed my life. Being fully committed and immersed in a church changed my life. And last year, Carol and I got to celebrate our 34th wedding anniversary, okay? And the reason, the reason that means so much to me is when somebody comes and goes, oh, I don't think Christ, the Bible, or, or being godly, or all this stuff, taking it seriously really makes a difference. All I have to do is haul out 150 years of past family patterns. Alcoholism, thrashed homes, broken homes, broken... And I just go, we have the longest running marriage in the history of my entire family tree. We took my family tree and cut it down, and it's kindling to build a whole new tree. No matter what your past is, God has better days ahead, because when you change your life, it changes your future. All God's people said, amen.